Well, hey, as you're sitting down and getting ready, if you have a Bible, you can crack that thing open to Judges chapter 6, and I will get there eventually. Um, if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. We're going to go on a little journey today. Uh, this week, as I studied and prepared, it was a little bit of a, a time of nostalgia for me. Uh, I don't know what decade is nostalgia for you. For me, it's the 90s. Uh, so you're like, well, the 90s, that was so recent. For me, it was forever ago. And, uh, and so as I prepared this week, and uh, do you remember in the 1990s, for those who are here in the 1990s, uh, people wearing clothing brand that said no fear? Do you remember the no fear? All right, okay, good. Um, I loved all these no fear shirts, and uh, between, between no fear shirts and my fluorescent colored gecko parachute pants, uh, come on, yeah, uh, my wardrobe was set, I was a pretty fly elementary school kid, uh, and I, I looked everywhere for, I would love to preach in one of those gecko shirts, like they're really hard to find, but fluorescent orange and fluorescent lime green were like prime colors for uh, fourth and fifth grade kids back in the 90s. Now, these no fear shirts, though, they would have snarky, insulting phrases on them that went along with the brand identity that fear makes you look weak, usually in a sports context. So uh, for now, I'm super redeemed and saved and, and uh, my, my personality is very warm and kind and loving. But but pre Jesus, I was very sarcastic and mean and, uh, and so, so the Lord's changed some of that about me. But their basic statement really resonated with me because uh, I also like to win. Does anyone here like to win at things? Uh, let me, this is a weird way to ask. Does anyone like to lose? Uh, okay, good. Uh, I hated to lose. And, and so this, like, this branding stuck with me. Their basic statement was that if you have fear, you're weak and that you shouldn't be weak. And if you don't want to be weak and have fear, then you have to have no fear, right? And so I did some research this week so I could bring to you some of these slogans that were on t-shirts from back in the day. Now, uh, the first one is, if you can't win, don't play, no fear, right? Okay, so that was on a shirt. Uh, another one said, losing is nature's way of saying that you suck. <laughs> Fear, just another four-letter word. Uh, this one I really like. He who dies with the most toys still dies. No fear. Uh, my second favorite, and I lived by this axiom like through my entire childhood and into adulthood. Second place is the first loser. Uh, the Gospel of Ricky Bobby said it. If you ain't first, you're last. And so... Uh, and then, right, like, no, there's second place. Like, you're, it's okay to get a silver medal or a bronze medal or to not win. Uh, but I really thought, like, yeah, man, if you don't win, you are losing. And, and so I thought these shirts were awesome. And they all say the same thing. You should not be afraid. And you came to church today on Halloween Sunday. I'm so glad you're here on Halloween Sunday. It's also Reformation Day, so it's a, there's a church component to it as well. But today's Halloween. I used my demon message last week, so I had to come up with something different for, for this week. And next week we move into the building, and I think it's the perfect time for us to talk about fear. Because I'm concerned that too many of us are living in fear. And we tend to think that the opposite of fear, the way I overcome fear is with courage, and that courage will help us overcome fear. Now, can I tell you, it does take courage to face your fears, right? If you're here and you're afraid of spiders, like my daughters were this week when there was a spider in the house, they're screaming like someone's got to come kill it. They didn't have the courage to face the spider and to kill it. And it was late at night. And I just told him, I, like, I don't want to get up. Just let him cry about it. And I guess I didn't know at the time that Abigail was stuck in the bathroom because the spider was blocking her way and she couldn't escape. But Amanda finally was like, I'll just deal with it. And she goes and they uh, find the spider and had hidden from them. And 
everyone is afraid of spiders. And no one had the courage to face the spider fear. And it can take courage to face our fears. And when you feel afraid and you stand your ground and your knees are rattling, right? Your teeth are chattering, your body's shaking, and you don't run away, but you face your fear, that is courage. And we need to be courageous. Joshua 1 9, God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So even in the bathroom with a spider trying to kill you, the Lord is with you even in those moments. And Joshua here, uh, God's reminding them of the command that came in Deuteronomy 31, 6, that God will never leave you or forsake you. And so whenever you feel afraid about anything, you can know that God is with you. But oftentimes we forget about God being with us and we respond in fear situations differently than courage. And and we can have courage when we face fear inducing times because we know that God is with us. We know that he'll never leave us. We know that God is in control and we can say no fear. Right? Have you ever like been in a situation where you're afraid and just told yourself, I'm not going to be afraid? Like it's the home alone scene. Like I'm not afraid anymore. And, and you can just not be afraid anymore. Uh, you know, God is with me. No fear is a little less insulting shirt for the no fear brand. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of uplifting scenes in that company. But, but while we need to be courageous, courage is not the opposite of fear. Courage helps us face fear. It helps us overcome our fears. But courage isn't the opposite of fear. Faith is the opposite of fear. Uh, Did you ever hear like the acronym for fear? False evidence appearing real. Uh, No fear, right? Like that's the same, probably from the same shirt company. Uh, And as I was studying this week and preparing for this, uh, and I was thinking about this no fear and this faith idea, Here's what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. It says, we live by faith, not by sight. When we live by sight, we often respond to fear. And when we walk in faith, fear doesn't impact us as greatly. And so if fear is seeing things that aren't so in God's eyes, right? It's seeing things that might terrify us or scare us, but, but it's not the way that God sees it. If that's what fear is, that it has the real power to accomplish the mission of the devil, which John 10.10 10 says is to steal, kill, and destroy you. Right. That, that's what the role of fear has in your life. It's for the enemy to come in and to steal what God wants to do and, and to kill and destroy us. And, and so let me pause right here before we really get into the meat of the message. Because you're like, we haven't even got to the part of the Bible you told me to open up yet. Yeah. <laughs> I told you we'd get there. We will. My goal for today is to challenge some thinking patterns that all of us have. And some of you are going to get upset. We've been here a month now. uh, And I've tried real care. I just want people to like me for the first three weeks. (laughs) So I want to give you a heads up now. uh, First and foremost, that I love you. As the pastor of this church, I care about you. I want God's best for each and every single one of you. Uh, And and so can you just remember that if during the message today you get angry and you're like, let's stone this guy and go back into the interview process and get someone else out here. Give give me some time, all right? Uh, Because we have to say no fear and yes to faith. Uh, And and so so I'm gonna repeat that a, a bit this morning. No fear, yes faith. Judges chapter six in the Bible, here's what it says. We'll start in verse one and two. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. The verses go on to to say that the Lord reminds the people and they cry out for him to deliver them. And hey, you know, God's like, I delivered you from Egypt. And, And they're in this situation because they chose to worship idols and not God. So God says all of this, and then if you get to verse 11, it says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. 
the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Verse 13, Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. It's not a great time for the Israelites during this. And, and they're asking, why has all this happened? And the Lord in these verses literally tells them exactly why they're in this situation. And it's because they didn't listen to him and they chose to worship idols. Gideon is afraid. He's hiding from his enemies. And if you look at the end, he's blaming the Lord for his circumstances. Lord, didn't you bring our ancestors out of Egypt? Now you've abandoned us and you've handed us over to our enemies. And I don't know about you, but I, I really identify with that over this last year or so that, that, that I've just been like, Lord, are, are you with us? Have you abandoned us? Like, where are you through some of these trials? And, and I hope that you maybe identify with that, that way that Gideon is feeling as well. And, and I hope that maybe you don't do what Gideon does or what I sometimes do is blame shift from ourselves to the Lord. Right? We say, Lord, you have made it so. Where have you been to allow it to be like this? In verse 14, the Lord turned to Gideon and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My plan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. The Lord does not tell Gideon in this circumstance to take courage and have no fear. He says, I will be with you. He tells Gideon, no fear, yes, faith. Because when we walk by sight and not by faith, we miss seeing God. When you're looking at your circumstances, you can't see the Lord. You can't see what he wants to do. And Israel is being tormented by the Midianites. They're being starved out. They're living in fear. People are getting tortured and killed. And there's no hero who rises up to deliver God's people. If you read through the entire book of Judges, generations would pass and God would raise people up and then they'd worship God for a little while and a decade or two, a generation would pass and they'd go right back into sin and God would raise people up and no one had been raised up yet and so God comes to Gideon. And God comes to find a willing coward. <laughs> Can I tell you, oftentimes we think like we're, we're looking for the right person, the person who looks like they could do the job. And the one who is willing is far more valuable to God in the kingdom than the one who has the talent and ability but is stubborn. Yeah. Than the one who rejects God when he comes before him and says, hey, hey, would you do this for me? And he says, no, Lord, I don't think that that's for me. I'm not good enough. I'm not adequate. And Gideon's in hiding. He's from a tribe that has no prestige. His clan is the weakest. He's the least in his family. And when we walk by sight, we would never choose Gideon to be the one to rescue us. He appears to be a coward. And just like when God chose King David to, to be the king, instead of all the brothers who looked the part, God sees things differently. And we have to walk by the sight that God sees not by the fear of the things that come when we look at the, this world that we live in. We need to walk by faith so that we can see through the eyes of the Lord. God calls Gideon mighty warrior or hero, even though he's timid and cowering and in hiding. And God is obviously not walking by sight because Gideon is a loser from a loser family, from a loser clan, from a loser tribe. Last picked for dodgeball and probably too afraid to play anyways. <laughs> now Gideon eventually listens to the Lord. He gathers an army. 32,000 warriors set off to go fight the Midianites. And God knows about you and I that, that we struggle just like the Israelites struggled with walking by faith and not by sight. And when we see things, we make assumptions. 
In an army of 32,000, God sees that, and you know what? That looks like too many warriors. If you're Gideon, if you're the people in the army, you're like, I don't know if we have enough to, to conquer these people. But God says, you guys have too many warriors. And God knows that if this group of people go out and they win the battle, they're going to take all the glory. They're going to take all the credit. And in Judges chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. They're going to walk by sight. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. God says, anyone who walks by sight and not by faith, anyone who's in this army who lives in fear and doesn't think that I will deliver you, go home. Don't want you in the army today. And two-thirds of them walk away. They, they leave the battle. They leave their fellow warriors. And that says to me that a majority of people are living by sight and not by faith. And I think that, that we're probably similar to this army that is gathered for Gideon. It's happening in our world today. We're, we're responding in fear and we look at something and say, I can't do that. And then we walk away and we don't do it. And people today are paralyzed by fear. But God knows. And so he whittled down the army. And he still knows 10,000 is too many as well. He said, if we have 10,000 and they win, they're going to steal my glory. They're still going to think it was done in their strength. And you and I, we take God's credit all the time because we see things and we think it was us. Oh, I was incredible today. <laughs> My singing on the word. I led so many people into the presence of the Lord. My preaching today was so incredible. Everyone felt the spirit of the Lord on, right? Like, and for whatever it is for you, you go to your job. Man, I did the most incredible work today. And we forget that God is the one who gifted and empowered us to be able to do the things that you're incredible at. And so God gives them another test and it whittles down the 10,000 all the way to 300. And now we're walking by faith. The 10,000, like, okay, I can see, like, they could pull out a victory in that, right? It'd be like the 49ers getting a win once in a while. Like, <laughs> miracles take place. Just want to see where you fall on that one. <laughs> Less than 1% of the original group that set out would continue on. And I don't know if you kind of survey Christians and, and the church landscape these days, but does it kind of feel like you might be part of a group that's 1%? Um, and, and maybe it's a little bit more, right? Depending on about 5% of people maybe go to church on a, on a Sunday, but, but that doesn't look very good. And my fear is that fear is going to keep you out of that small faithful group that will get to see God move. In verse 7, the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, with the 1%, I'm going to rescue you, give you victory over the Midianites, send everybody else home. And here's what I think is important for you and I to understand when it comes to fear. Not many people will get to see the infinite, awesome power of the Lord because we walk by sight and not by faith. 32,000 start off, 300 finish. I want you to feel the weight of that. Let that sink in. I'll tell it to you in another way. I started off with a lot of peers and friends in ministry. And over the years, many pastors who I've known have fallen out of ministry. They, they've walked away, some even from knowing and following the Lord. It's a hard thing to follow Jesus. And the way to finish with the Lord is to continually walk with him, to trust in him, and to have no fear, and yes, faith. Those who follow Jesus fearlessly are in an extreme minority. And the only fear that God allows is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1.7 says, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. My favorite thing when people come meet with me and I espouse biblical wisdom or, or offer 
disciplined from the Bible and they reject it, I can just be like, fools. Those fools. The Bible calls them that, not me. And you probably feel the same way. When you give someone good advice and they don't take it and they get themselves in the same trouble they've been in, you're like, well, if you had just listened, I could have spared you from all this trouble, you fool. And you don't say that, hopefully. I've never said it. I just... <laughs> when we hear wisdom or when we face being disciplined by someone, by the Bible, by the Lord, and we reject it, we're acting foolish. Now, I want you to consider a fear that you're dealing with that's causing you to miss some things from the Lord. I I'm going to tell you what it is. You're like, you might be afraid of a hundred things today. There's really one major thing that I want to talk about. And, and right now, most people fall into one of two extremes when it comes to fear as it relates to the last 19 months of COVID. Fear of getting a vaccine or being told by the government what to do or fear of a virus. And you might not identify it as fear, but our corporate response nationwide as a church through this pandemic has revealed that we're walking by sight and not by faith. Now, I want you to understand, right? I, I'm not picking and choosing who's right or wrong. I don't have the ability to do that. But, but I want all of us to recognize wherever we are at, we're probably responding to some things in this world today out of fear and out of things that, that we're seeing. And for some, we need to be reminded that losing our lives to a virus is not the end of the world. I recognize some of us have lost loved ones to COVID and we grieve together. It, it, it's been a rough season. It's terrible for us when anyone loses their life, but people die in all kinds of ways all the time, every day. And we use wisdom and discernment in how we live our life, but we don't live our life in response to fear. And can I remind you, that death while knowing Jesus is the ultimate goal for everybody who knows Christ. That that's what we strive for is to one day pass from this world knowing Christ. John chapter 11 verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. We have eternal life and so there should be nothing in this world that scares us. Conversely, because I like to offend equally. <laughs> the fear of government control and mandates and not doing things because you might not like it for the benefit of others is costing the church its witness yeah. to a non-believing world. Christians are devouring each other and it is not Christ-like. Can, can I tell you, it, it doesn't matter how you believe what you believe for yourself. That's fine. You have the freedom. And the Lord speaks to people differently. And so you can be on either side of this camp and be right where the Lord is speaking to you about what's right for you. That doesn't make it a universal truth. It doesn't make it a biblical truth that needs to apply to everybody. The Lord speaks to each of us about how we should respond. And as the church, as someone who follows Christ, we should respect other people's beliefs when it comes to this thing. And if you've been online, if you've been on social media, you've probably seen there's some divisive stuff out there. And can I tell you, that division comes from the enemy. That division is what is killing and destroying the church. And it's why a third of all churchgoers pre-COVID never returned to the church. That's a major concern for me as a pastor. That, that people said, I'm just going to opt out. I've seen some things in people who I thought were Christians. And on either side, right? If it's a, I thought that person was a Christian, but the way they're behaving has caused me to question if Jesus is real, then maybe even if we firmly believe it, we, we could figure out a way to communicate how we feel in a way that, that shows we still love people. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24 says, don't be concerned for your own good but for the good of others. Yeah. I think sometimes we forget because I want to do what I want to do, right? I know that you want to do what you want to do. 
And could you imagine a church if everybody's opinion, we just took them all and we did everything that everyone thought about everything in the church. It wouldn't work because we believe different things and we think things should be different. This light should be this way and this light should be this way. This volume should be here and this volume should be here. We should dress this way when we come to church. No, we should dress this way. Imagine all the things that we could disagree on if we focus on the things that we disagree on. And Paul writes to a really dysfunctional church in Corinth, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And so I, I wear a mask, I get a vaccine, so others are safe or feel safer. Because I, you, you wanna know why I got the vaccine? I'll just tell you right now. Uh, because if it was gonna kill me, I know where I'm going and then my wife and kids don't have to deal with it. <laughs> I'd be gone, but they wouldn't get it and drop dead also. So I got it right away. Listen, I'll get this thing. I've gotten other unsanctioned vaccines so I could do world travel. So I've, just pop this stuff into me and let's see what happens. And if I mutate, awesome. The Lord's still with me. <laughs> and as it turns out, like literally nothing was different. Uh, I had a sore arm for a day and, and I was okay. And you know what? I hate wearing a mask. But if I want to be with people who want someone to wear a mask, I, I want to become all things to all men, as Paul said. I want to not be yeah. concerned for my own good, but for the good of others. Yeah. And you know what? I, I also don't like the government telling me what to do. But I'm okay for people who feel like we should do what, what is being asked of us because there's a world out there who wants to do what the government tells them to do. And when we come under that authority that, by the way, even these ungodly government systems that are in place, God allowed them to be in place for a reason. Maybe there's a purpose behind that. God's not surprised by it. We only think that because we've been free for so long. Go to, go to some foreign countries. Like the church can't even meet like this in places around the world. We're richly blessed. And our perspective is skewed because we've had such great freedom. And can I tell you, if any of those things kill me, God knew it was my time that I get to be with Jesus. And so we have both sides of the equation, living in fear, causing division, damaging ourselves, our witness, and the kingdom. And we just need to say no to fear and yes to faith. Because the division that it's caused, can I say, whatever you feel is right for you, I affirm that today. It, I believe that you're able to hear from the Lord and that you need to make the best decision for you. And so when we go back into the building next week, there'll be an online option. If you say, I'm not ready to be indoors, that's the right thing for you. And if you come indoors and, and there's a mask requirement, that, that's okay. Like, hey, we're gonna do this so that some people who will come because there's masks, from the outside and the inside will still come. And if you say, well, I'm not coming if there's a mask, there's an online option for you as well. And we'll be here when you're ready to come, no matter how you feel about things. But we have to stop the divisive nature that is a response to fear in this world today. Michael Scott from The Office. <laughs> Smooth transition. <laughs> Quoting Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And maybe you've heard that before. It's a good no fear shirt saying, uh, except that quote didn't originate with Wayne Gretzky. Uh, his coach or dad told him, if you can't, or you can't score if you don't shoot. And that idiom goes back even further to 1941 when a salesman wrote in a book that his father told him, you can't expect to get a hit if you don't swing at the ball. And that idiom goes back even further to a book called the Athenaeum, published in 1861. And it says, you cannot expect to reap the corn you have not sown. You cannot win unless you work. And that idiom, <laughs> the Bible happens to have said something similar a few thousand years before in Galatians chapter six. And here's what it says. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, 
he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, of eternal life. That's the message version of, of that. But, but I think it's so true to where we're at today when, when we are reaping fear in our life is because we probably sown it in some form or another. We're living in response to what we see. And when we walk by sight, we sow fear and doubt into the power of God in our lives. And when we live this way, we cause division and strife in the church. And the church should be the most welcoming and loving organization to people who are not part of it. And we should sacrifice our own freedoms and liberties so that we might win yeah. some. What we've forgotten is that the most important thing about this life is that we win people into the kingdom. And that we should be willing to do whatever it takes to win people, to have the chance to win people. We're part of that 32,000 that set off to accomplish something great for the Lord, right? We're here today because we want to be part of the greatness of God in his kingdom. We set off to, to do that only to find ourselves dismissed from the army because of our actions. But we live by faith, not by sight. We say no to fear and yes to faith. And when we walk by faith, we'll get to see God do the miraculous. Because yeah. if you continue to read Gideon and his 300 warriors, the the power of God on their side, they would completely destroy the Midianite army forever. They would experience great victory in the Lord because it was whittled down to those who were willing to walk by faith. And they got to see the miracle because they lived by faith and they followed Jesus and they ignored the fear that came with what had surrounded them. If they, they responded out of what they could see, I would be terrified. You would be terrified. There's 300 of us and there's thousands of them. This is not good. God, you, you got us into a bad situation. But being in that bad situation from how it looked externally is what allowed them to experience the miracle. And they ignored the fear that came with what they could see. And they won the victory by walking in faith. Now, you might have just thought to yourself, like, Pastor Sean Gideon didn't follow Jesus in his life. You ever heard that, like, when you talk about Old Testament people, I'm like, he got to see Jesus do a miracle. Uh, I want you to look at this, because Gideon offers a sacrifice after the angel of the Lord spoke back in, in chapter 6. And then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Gideon offers a sacrifice, and it was received. Angels of the Lord in the Old Testament, if it's not Jesus, they refuse worship. Uh, you see, like, people bow down, and the angel's like, get up, don't worship me, I'm not the Lord. And this angel of the Lord receives Gideon's worship, and, and, and so it's Jesus that he's had an encounter with that has allowed him to walk by faith. Gideon encountered Jesus, his faith in God allowed him to follow Jesus and overcome his fear. And so I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But I want you to understand when you live by faith and not by sight, you're going to see Jesus. You will encounter Jesus in your life and your fear will fall to your faith. John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's, that's you, if you're here today and you believe in Jesus. This is Jesus praying for you. Verse 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. 
I just think that if we could live out Jesus' prayer for us, that we would be one, that we would be unified even in our differences, that the world, an unbelieving world, would want to, to come see and be part of what God has for us. So let me pray for you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Lord, maybe a harder message for some of us to hear today. Maybe for those of us struggling with fear, not just the COVID issue, God, just fear in general. God, we're grateful that, that Paul writes, God, you have not given us a spirit of fear, yeah. a spirit of timidity. God, you've given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. And so, God, I just pray that for, for every single person in this church today, for every person who's going to watch later online, God, that you would remove the spirit of fear, that you would give us power and love and self-discipline, God, to accomplish your will for our lives. God, whether that's to be vaccinated or not be vaccinated, whether that's to, to be indoors or to stay online, God, whatever it is for us, we pray, God, that, that each and every single one of us would honor the decision of the one who thinks differently. And that in that unity, this church would strengthen, this church would grow, this church would be a beacon of light to people who don't know you, God. We pray, God, that as we walk in unity, that you would bind us together, that you would strengthen us. Lord, I just pray for those who've been dealing with fear. For those who've maybe been extra vocal to those who believe different, for those who've lost friendships over it. Can we just pray for a reset? That today we would come before you, that we would repent of any wrongdoing that we have done, any hurt that we have caused someone else for something that has nothing to do with their salvation. God, maybe there's someone this week we need to reach back out to and, and apologize. Maybe it's just in our own hearts. God, I pray that you would prepare us as a church, as we move back inside. We pray for your safety, for your protection. We pray for the leadership as they make decisions that might not be popular with everyone. Understanding, God, that, that we have the church's best interest at heart. We have your heart at the forefront of everything that we do. Most important, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, it's really hard to, to walk a faith-sighted life if you don't have the Spirit of God in you. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I just want to give you the opportunity to surrender your life to Him. It's as simple as just saying, I recognize that I need Jesus. I need Him to forgive me. I need to surrender my life to Him. And if that's you and you're here, would you just raise your hand so that I know that, that, that I'm praying with you today? I just want to give you that chance. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, for the hands that were raised, we just pray that in Jesus' name, as they recognize their, their need for you, God, that you would forgive them of their sins. Lord, we're so thankful that you came and lived a perfect life that we could never measure up to, and then you sacrificed that life when you died on the cross for us to set us free of our sin. God, we confess our sins before you now. We ask for your forgiveness and we invite your spirit to be in us, to lead us and to guide us, to help us to walk by faith. For the first time, maybe it's been a while, but God, for those hands that were raised, we just pray that you would seal this decision and commitment in their hearts. God, for the rest of us, we pray that as you go out this week, we'd be reminded to not respond in fear, but to walk by faith. Pray, Lord, for the emails that may come in, that they would be warm and loving. <laughs>
God, we trust you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, hey.